Today we're going to talk about water pollution. This comes from the textbook Friedland and Relia, uh, Environmental Science for AP, and it comes from the beginning of chapter 14. So we're going to look at different types of water pollutants and their effect on the surroundings and then what we can do about it. So first of all, all of our water pollution can in general be divided into two main categories, point sources and non-point sources. A point source is when a uh, pollutant enters the waterway at a specific identifiable point. It's something you could put a pin on in a map. So for example, this could be a factory, it could be a single sewage pipe, it could be an oil spill from a tanker, or in the case like of the case of the Deepwater Horizon, from a bursted oil well that's deep under the ocean. Uh, anything that occurs at a single point where you can identify the source. A non-point source is when pollution enters the waterway from a really broad, diff diffuse source that cannot be isolated or traced to any one specific place. So an example of this would be urban runoff. In urban runoff, we have uh, runoff that comes from an entire urban area. It could be from a neighborhood or from a small city or everywhere in a watershed. And the runoff can't be traced to a single house or a single person's pollution, but it's all of the collective pollution that was created by that community. Agricultural runoff is similar because agriculture takes place of a broad area, so it's difficult to pinpoint which particular farm or farmer is doing the pollution. And then automobiles are also considered non-point sources when you take them all together because we have so many of them and they move around. Um, collectively, they generate a lot of pollution. So just to make sure you're following along, ask yourself this question. Which of the following is a point source? Is it A, a residential development? B, a nuclear power plant? C, an agricultural region? Or D, a watershed? So take a moment and think about it. Pause if you need to, roll back if you need to to review from the previous slide. And the correct answer is B, a nuclear power plant. So a nuclear power plant is a point source because it is a single identifiable s location on a map. All the other three are broad areas. Residential developments, agricultural regions, and watersheds are all broad areas. So all three of those would be considered non-point sources. So now we also have several different types of sources of water pollution. And these are key words that are used to refer to solid waste and to refer to air pollution and things like that. So it's important you understand what these terms mean. So first of all, if we're talking about a municipal source, municipal refers to pollution from a town or a city. So a municipality is, you know, an area that has been organized into some form of, under some form of government or charter. So that would be like Costa Mesa is a municipality. The word municipal typically means town or city pollution, or a town or referring to a town or a city. We also have industrial sources. Industrial sources mean that they are uh, sources related to industry or factories, places where manufacturing is going on, for example, or energy generation, things like that. So those are all considered industrial. And then we also have agricultural sources. So these are things, anything that refers to the production of food or food products or um, the growing of crops. So things like cotton would be included in that. So agricultural um, can refer to farms, ranches, feedlots, CAFOs, hog farms, anything where we're producing livestock or growing plants on a large scale. So let's take a step back and review a bit from uh, our ecology unit. Let's talk about what e aquatic ecosystems need to be healthy, because this is going to help us understand when things go wrong, why the different types of pollution cause the problems that they do. So first of all, aquatic ecosystems need dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen is oxygen gas, O2, and it dissolves into the water from the air, usually. The second source of dissolved oxygen, if it isn't coming from uh, water mixing with air, is that it can be produced by photosynthesis. So if you have algae or underwater plants that are doing photosynthesis, those things can produce dissolved oxygen and increase the dissolved oxygen level in the water. 
In addition to dissolved oxygen, which is what all animals that do cellular respiration need in order to breathe, all the animals, the bacteria, the invertebrates, things like that. In addition to dissolved oxygen, uh, aquatic ecosystems need small amounts of nitrates. So nitrate is one of our fertilizers. It's one of the things that uh, plants require for growth. And so if you remember from our biogeochemical cycles, nitrates are what help plants to grow, and then animals are able to get their nitrates when they consume plants. So we do need small amounts of nitrates, and we also need small amounts of phosphates. This is our other fertilizer. Uh, nitrates is NO3, phosphate, phosphates is PO4. And these two fertilizers are typically the two limiting factors for aquatic ecosystems. Usually the growth of plants or algae is limited by the presence or absence of nitrates and phosphates. Another important category of nutrients is uh, heavy metals such as iron. So uh, plants and uh, plants especially need iron and other heavy metals in order to grow because they incorporate them into their proteins and into their structure. So without iron, there are some, uh, which, you know, in some cases is a limiting factor. We won't see the same kind of plant growth that we would expect or algae growth. And then finally, aquatic ecosystems need clear waters for photosynthesis. Clear water is important so that sunlight can penetrate deeper in the water, and that allows photosynthesis to take place at deeper depths. So let's put all of these things together, um, store them all in the back of your head, because as we talk through the next few slides, you're going to see what happens when these different uh, types or needs for aquatic ecosystems are not met. All right, so our first issue that we're going to discuss is oxygen demanding wastes. These are also uh, t a type of biodegradable waste is another way of talking about them. This is any type, any type of organic waste that can be broken down by decomposers. So these are wastes that decomposers can process and break down back into carbon dioxide, nitrates, and phosphates using cellular respiration. When decomposers eat waste, when they do cellular respiration, they reproduce and grow, and they consume oxygen. So the presence of oxygen-demanding wastes is what increases the biochemical oxygen demand, or BOD, in the water. So this is basically a measure that tells us how much oxygen is required for the decomposers to be able to break down all of the oxygen-demanding waste in the water. So if we were to take, like, let's say, a pile of dead plants and throw it into a lake, we've just increased the biochemical oxygen demand by adding oxygen demanding waste. So the biochemical oxygen demand would then be measured by how much oxygen decomposers would need to use up in order to break down the waste we just threw into the lake. I don't recommend throwing your waste into lakes, by the way, just for reference there. So what happens is that as decomposers eat the waste and reproduce and consume the oxygen, this leads to overall decreased dissolved oxygen in the water and can eventually lead to the death of fish and other um, aquatic invertebrates or things like that. So we will talk about the fish kills and uh, things like that in a few slides when we talk about eutrophication. Let's take a look first at what happens when a freshwater stream is polluted by an input of some kind of uh, oxygen demanding waste. So if you notice in this picture, the stream is flowing from left to right. And you can see there right by the first dotted line that there's a pipe and it's dumping some kind of disgusting brown goop into the water. Now for the sake of argument, we're going to assume that that goop is some type of oxygen demanding waste. It could be manure runoff from a cow farm, like a feedlot or from a pig farm. It could be sewage sludge that was not treated properly. Uh, it could be some kind of thing that came from a factory that happens to be organic and can be broken down by decomposers. So you can see in our normal water, um, we've got on the left-hand side, the blue line is at eight parts per million for dissolved oxygen, and our biological or biochemical oxygen demand is very low, that's the red line. Now as you follow the stream, moving downstream, as soon as we get to the point where the waste is added, uh, if you look right over here on the screen, as soon as you get to the point where the waste is added, 
the biochemical oxygen demand goes way up because all of a sudden we have a waste in the water that's going to require oxygen to be broken down. So the biochemical oxygen demand spikes up immediately and as we proceed downstream, the dissolved oxygen level begins to decrease. This is because the bacteria immediately begin decomposing all of that organic waste that was added to the water. So the dissolved oxygen decreases and we end up in this zone of decomposition where we only have certain types of fish that are able to live. So if you notice over here on the left, we have normal clean water organisms. These are things like trout, perch, bass, mayflies, stoneflies. The mayflies and the stoneflies were actually the larvae we were looking for um, that you would look for in uh, a biodiversity index to see how healthy your stream is. So if everything's going well, we're gonna see these kinds of organisms here. Now when we move over to the decomposition zone, we're going to only find trash fish. These are fish that are able to live in lower amounts of oxygen. They're able to live in polluted water. So things like carp, leeches, uh, not, not the kind of fish that you normally think about as being, you know, great healthy water fish. Now after the decomposition zone, we have a zone called the septic zone. This is a zone where you can see here the, bio, the biochemical oxygen demand is beginning to decrease as decomposition has progressed, but our dissolved oxygen is at its very lowest. We're down close to zero here. So in the septic zone, we actually don't have any fish in the water. That's because the water has such low levels of dissolved oxygen that fish can't survive there. So instead, what we have is fungi, sludge, worms, we have bacteria that can survive in the absence of oxygen, things that are able to live in really, really poor conditions. And then as the stream continues to flow, um, we have water starting to mix with the air a little bit more. Remember that oxygen can dissolve from the atmosphere into the water. And so as the stream begins to flow, maybe it flows over some rocks, maybe the wind blows a little bit and riffles the surface. This allows more and more oxygen to be added into the stream. So we're, uh, we have a recovery zone that comes next. And in the recovery zone, we again see those same trash fish that we saw back in the decomposition zone. So the oxygen level's beginning to come back. These are fish that can live in polluted waters. And then eventually we'll hit a clean zone again where the stream health returns to normal. So I know in this picture, it makes it look like all of this happens within a span of about 20 feet or so. But in reality, um, a stream can run for several hundred feet, um, possibly even into a mile or more before it's able to fully recover from the influx of some kind of organic waste. So especially if it's a very large amount of organic waste, it's gonna take much longer for the stream to recover. And huge stretches of that stream or river are gonna be affected by the addition of this oxygen demanding waste. So this is an important concept for you guys to understand for the AP test. And uh, hopefully this chart made it a little bit more clear. So just to test your knowledge, um, ask yourself this quiz question, and if you get it wrong, make sure you go back, roll the video back, and review the previous couple of slides so that you understand what you're missing here. So, as BOD increases, and remember BOD stands for biochemical oxygen demand, DO, or dissolved oxygen, does what? Is it A, increases, or B, decreases? So, as our biochemical oxygen demand increases, dissolved oxygen does blank. So pause, think about it. When you're sure of the answer, uh, you can move the video forward. And the correct answer is that dissolved oxygen decreases. So if you remember from our figure, the biochemical oxygen demand, as that increases, it means that decomposers need more and more oxygen to be able to decompose all the waste in the water. So as they process the waste, the dissolved oxygen levels go down. Like I said, if you didn't understand that or you said increases and thought you were right, roll back the video, go back and review that section so that you make sure that you understand where, um, where we're coming from and why this answer is decreases. All right, so now we're gonna talk about nitrates and phosphates, which are the fertilizers. These are what we use on land when we want our crops to grow better. Uh, in the water, they have different issues. So you need to be familiar with the abbreviations, the chemical abbreviations. So nitrates are NO3, phosphates are actually PO4 plus, uh, PO4, PO4 plus there. 
And the main sources of these two chemicals in aquatic ecosystems are from fertilizer runoff from both agricultural and residential usage. So I know res agricultural makes a lot of sense. Pe farmers are putting these fertilizers on their crops to help them grow better. But in residential areas, uh, people actually do also like to fertilize their lawns and their gardens. And a lot of times what will happen is that homeowners will put too much miracle Grow on their lawn or they'll over fertilize their lawn or their garden. And then when it rains, uh, we get the same issue as with agriculture is that that extra fertilizer that hasn't been absorbed by plants runs off into the storm drain and then makes its way out into aquatic ecosystems. So nitrates and phosphates are two chemicals that actually lead to increased algae growth in water, which can lead to a process called eutrophication. So that increased algae growth, um, we would think normally that algae would be great because algae do photosynthesis, but there are a lot of problems with increased algae growth, especially huge eruptions of algae, and so we'll talk about those uh, right here. Cultural eutrophication. Now eutrophication is the general name for the process, and we put the word cultural in front of it to mean that it was caused by humans. Another way you could say this is anthropogenic eutrophication. Remember, anthropogenic, anthro meaning man, genic meaning produced or generated. So anthropogenic eutrophication is a, the process of eutrophication that's been caused by humans. So this is a big word. You're going to hear it a lot because it's a really key concept for apes. But what is eutrophication? Uh, eutrophication tells like a story. It's a series of events that take place. So eutrophication starts when we have large amounts of nitrates and phosphates that enter a waterway. So this could be agricultural runoff, residential runoff. If you went down to a stream or a lake and you just started dumping bags of fertilizer in, we'd have the same problem. Any large source of nitrates and phosphates can cause eutrophication. So because of this, the excess nitrates and phosphates, there is a rapid growth of algae. So the algae are kind of like miniature plants. They use the nitrates and phosphates to grow and divide and grow and divide and grow and divide. And so they actually can cover the surface of the water. This will increase turbidity, uh, which is one of the negative side effects of cultural eutrophication. Um, and these algae just will continue to grow and multiply until they run out of nutrients. So once the nutrients are consumed, the algae then die all, all together. So you'll have, instead of huge mats of living algae, you have huge mats or huge masses of dead algae. Now, the dead algae are actually an organic waste now. Dead algae can be eaten by bacteria, by our decomposers. So the dead algae lead to an increased biochemical oxygen demand. That means that the decomposers will need to consume a certain amount of oxygen in order to decompose the dead algae. So the decomposers feed on the dead algae, and in the process of doing cellular respiration, they use up more and more and more of the oxygen that's in the water. Once the decomposers have started their work on those dead algae, the dissolved oxygen level drops from healthy levels, which is around um, 6 parts per million or higher is considered a healthy level for dissolved oxygen. It drops down to levels that are considered fish kill levels. And the reason we call them fish kills is because there have been cases where eutrophication in a lake has actually been so expansive that the fish haven't had anywhere in the water to go that actually had oxygen in it. So the fish end up dying. Um, anytime the water get the water has less than five parts per million of oxygen, so but like between three and five, that causes a lot of stress on aquatic organisms. And once we get below three parts per million of oxygen, we actually don't have enough oxygen for most aquatic organisms to live. So that's when you get these large deaths of fish. So what can happen over time is that a, something called a dead zone can develop if this happens too often or in too large of an area. And a dead zone is basically an area of water that from the surface would look perfectly healthy, but if you were to test the quality of the water and go down a few feet underwater, you would find that there isn't any dissolved oxygen in the water, not nearly enough to support aquatic life. So uh, one of the places where this dead zone has formed, actually, is at the mouth of the Mississippi River, where the Mississippi River enters the Gulf of Mexico. So 
you can see here we have Louisiana in the picture and the Mississippi runs right down through here and because of the way that this runoff is generated and we actually have this area here in red which is the dead zone off the coast of Louisiana. Now there isn't a scale on this map but we're talking like hundreds of miles here of water that doesn't have any, enough oxygen in it to support life. <clears throat> so the green area is greater oxygen concentrations, the red is lower oxygen concentrations, and this is because the Mississippi River runs through a whole lot of agricultural areas, so it carries agricultural runoff from the entire central United States down the river and carries all those nitrates and phosphates out into the Gulf of Mexico. And as they flow out into the Gulf of Mexico, they create eutrophication, so algae blooms and then the decomposers eating the dead algae, and then the dead zone forming, the dissolved oxygen going down in the dead zone forming. So this is something, this is one of the largest um, dead zones in the United States or in the United States waters. We also have a smaller dead zone off the coast of California that's up near Monterey, and there are a few others in different places. But scientists monitor these because we want to make sure that they're not spreading and we want to do what we can to remediate these areas. So we talked a little bit about fish kill. Um, if you were to have dissolved oxygen levels drop, this is what you could find happening in your lake. So these are all bodies of dead fish that are floating in the water because this particular area of the lake, the dissolved oxygen concentration dropped so low that the fish could no longer survive. So um, one of the problems with this actually is that now we have a whole bunch of dead fish in the water and dead fish increase the biochemical oxygen demand by themselves being dead in the water because now the decomposers have more stuff that they need to break down. So it's kind of a self-perpetuating cycle once it begins, which can cause a lot of problems, as you can see, for an aquatic ecosystem. Nobody likes to smell a whole bunch of rotten, stinking, decomposing fish. And now this lake is no longer good for people to fish from. All right, so quiz question to make sure you're following along okay. If you get this one right, move on. If you get it wrong, go back and review the last section. So dead zones are caused by A, habitat fragmentation, B, cogeneration, C, deforestation, or D, eutrophication. So go ahead and pause the video. Think about that for a minute. When you think you know the right answer, go ahead and resume. And the correct answer is D, eutrophication. Dead zones are caused by eutrophication. Eutrophication is that big long word that refers to the entire process of having too many nutrients added to the water, which leads to an algae bloom and then algae death and then decomposers breaking down the dead algae and then dissolved oxygen decreasing and making conditions unlivable for other aquatic life. So that all of that together is eutrophication. And it's a lot to remember, but hopefully you can drill it into your heads. All right, let's talk about some other things. We've also got other water issues like infectious agents. Now, infectious agents are anything that can cause disease and, uh, you know, from people drinking the water. And usually they pollute the water via fecal matter, which is another way for saying poop. So in the United States, this is fecal matter coming from cattle or pigs or chickens or other livestock in general. Um, in other countries, this can actually be human fecal matter that's polluting the water as well. There are some infectious agents that can survive in water um, for long periods of time and did not come from fecal matter or didn't recently come from fecal matter. So that's another thing that you need to be aware of. So there's a whole bunch of examples. Um, as if you watched the video Food Inc., you will have heard them discuss a certain strain of E. coli that can cause, um, it's called hemorrhagic E. coli, and it can cause internal bleeding and an organ failure. So certain types of E. coli can be your infectious agent. There's also bacteria that cause cholera and dysentery, which are two types of waterborne illnesses. There are viruses that cause hepatitis A and polio that can be transmitted through the water. And then there's also parasites, which are um, larger organisms. Then they can cause things like amoebic dysentery, because they're caused by amoeba, and uh, GR, uh, giardiasis, which is uh, caused by the giardia parasite. You don't need to memorize all of those. 
but you may have to be able to recognize some of those words on the AP test. So just kind of familiarize yourself with them or Google the ones that you aren't familiar with and read like the Wikipedia entry just to get a good idea of what's going on. So there are, I would say, tens to hundreds, if not thousands of different infectious agents. And it's very difficult for scientists to take a water sample and then test for all of them because it would be a lot of series of tests. They'd have to test for each one individually and use an antibody to stain for it or look at it under a microscope and try and identify them to figure out whether they were infectious or not. So instead of testing for each different disease-causing organism, uh, we actually test for the possible presence of disease-causing organisms. We test for two different things that we know are found in fecal matter. So total coliform bacteria and fecal coliform bacteria are two families of bacteria that grow in the intestines of all warm-blooded animals. So if we find total coliform or fecal coliform bacteria in our water sample, we would know that somehow the poop of these warm-blooded animals was able to get into the water. So both of these two bacteria are harmless. They don't cause any disease at all. But finding them means that there was poop in the water. So that's why we use it. And we're not going to say for sure that that poop also brought in Giardia or uh, cholera bacteria or dysentery or E. coli, but at least we know that if we find these coliform bacteria, that we also are going to, uh, we'll know for sure that poop has entered the water, fecal matter has entered the water, and then we need to close off that area from human contact just to avoid the risk of people getting sick. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, we use, we basically use total coliform bacteria and fecal coliform bacteria as indicator species for the presence of fecal matter. So those two bacteria are not harmful. They don't cause any diseases, but they will let us know that there was fecal matter in the water and that there's a potential for disease. So that's how we kind of mitigate the problems with infectious agents. Now, if you're in a situation where you need to drink a st from a stream or a lake, um, maybe you were lost in the woods and you don't have any water and you come across a stream, um, the best thing you can do is to treat the water in some way. So boiling it works because that'll kill almost all of these things. Uh, you can also, if you have like a small amount of bleach, you can add a few drops of bleach to the water because that will kill almost all of these things that could be living in the water. You can also, if you're really, really desperate, set it out in the sunlight and if you have direct bright sunlight because UV rays can also help kill some of the things, although sunlight is not the best method. It's much less reliable than using boiling or bleach. And then if you like to travel a lot and you like to backpack or camp out in the woods or, you know, get into yourself into situations where you need to use water from outdoors, you can also bring along little tablets or filters or things that are designed for purifying water. And so they're actually developing a lot of these mechanisms that are very inexpensive and don't have any moving parts and don't have to be replaced very often. And they're sending them to um, developing nations where water pollution is a much bigger issue. So in the United States, there's a chance that you'll get sick from drinking water. In other places, um, like certain countries in Africa, um, parts of Southeast Asia, India, you very much will get sick from drinking the water. And so um, waterborne disease is a major killer, especially of young children. It contributes a lot to the infant mortality rate. So there are a lot of agencies that are working on developing better ways of treating water for infectious agents so that they can make water drinkable and provide safe drinking water to people in these developing nations and these rural communities. So it's a really cool thing. If you want to look into that, um, or if you're interested in design or engineering, go into that field. It's an awesome, awesome area of study. So just to make sure you understood some of the main points from the previous slide, uh, true or false, fecal coliform bacteria is a deadly pathogen. Is that A, true, or B, false? So go ahead and think about that. Pause, go back if you need to. The correct answer is... B, that is false. Fecal coliform bacteria is not a deadly pathogen. It does not cause disease. Fecal coliform bacteria is an indicator bacteria that shows us that there is fecal matter in the water 
which should be an indicator to us that we probably don't want to drink it, probably don't want to swim in it, because it may also have deadly pathogens in it. If you got that wrong, go back and review. All right, so let's talk about some new problems that are coming up. Uh, one of the most important emerging problems is this idea of endocrine disruptors. So endocrine refers to your endocrine system, which is the hormone system for the body. And it's not just human hormones we're worried about, but we're actually worried about hormones of aquatic organisms. So endocrine disruptors are any chemical that can mimic a hormone like estrogen. So there are certain chemicals found in soy plants that can bind in the body to the same places that estrogen binds. There are other chemicals that can bind to the same places where testosterone binds. So, um, and then that the same is true for all different kinds of chemicals that can bind to all different binding sites for all these different hormones. Estrogen is one of the major hormones that is being replicated or imitated by these chemicals and um, it's causing a lot of issues. So endocrine disruptors are found in a variety of places. They're found in pharmaceutical products. So things as simple as, you know, your over-the-counter pain medication, found in birth control, they're found in sunscreen. They can also be found in prescription drugs and um, a lot of other different human-produced or anthropogenic uh, products that are brought into the home. So the big problem with endocrine disruptors is that they disrupt the hormone cycles of fish and other aquatic organisms. We've seen the issue with fish for sure. Um, I think they've also discovered it in frogs. And there are some areas that have been polluted so badly that the fish have the fish uh, breeding ratio has changed from 50-50 male-female to as much as 65% female, 35% male. And that's because that extra estrogen that's present in the water actually tells the baby fish as they're developing to become female rather than male. And so this is leading to um, a skewed sex ratio. And the problem with the skewed sex ratio means then that if you have fish where you're going to pair up evenly, um, you actually can only have as many female fish breeding as you have male fish. So um, if you have 35% males, they're only going to breed with 35% of the females uh, or the 35% of females. And then you're going to be left with another 30% of females that aren't breeding, uh, give or take. So this can actually reduce the population size for different fish species because the sex ratio has been skewed. So what's our big solution to endocrine disruptors? Very important. Do not dump your medication or your sunscreen or any of these things down the drain. And you're saying, I don't dump sunscreen down the drain out of the bottle. So um, you want to be careful. Use as little sunscreen as you can. I mean, sunscreen is really important. But don't like slather it on and then immediately go jump in the ocean because anything that wasn't absorbed by your skin isn't going to just wash right off. So let your skin absorb the sunscreen. Wait a few extra minutes before you go into that ocean or lake. Uh, if you have leftover medicine, like you have a prescription drug, but you're, it's old, it's expired, you're not going to use the rest of it, make sure that the cap is sealed on and locked completely and throw it in the trash can. Don't flush it down the toilet. Uh, same thing goes for any leftover pain medications or any other birth control or anything like that. Just make sure that those things don't go down the drain. They can go to the landfill, that's fine, but we want to avoid these things getting down our drains and into our water. So in general, what can you do about water pollution? And there's a few things. I'm going to run through them pretty quickly because we're coming to the end here. Uh, first of all, try and fertilize your garden or, or your yard and plants with manure or compost instead of commercial inorganic fertilizer. So if you go to Home Depot and you want to plant a garden, don't buy miracle Grow. Buy that bag that's much bigger and heavier but is made up of manure or compost, which that you can then mix into your soil. It's actually going to improve the quality of your soil by improving the texture, as well as providing your plants with the nutrients they need. You want to minimize your use of pesticides whenever possible. It's actually much better to make a little soap solution to spray on your plants to kill insects rather than um, spraying like different insect killer chemicals and things like that. A little bit of soapy water does works wonders. And there are lots of other solutions you can find online depending on what type of pest you're dealing with. Uh, it's important that when you are purchasing food that you grow or buy organic foods. 
because that's going to reduce the amount of pesticides that are used on the different farms that are producing our food. And then also compost your food waste because then instead of going to Home Depot to get compost for your garden, you can actually compost the food waste from your house and then spread that on your garden. So it's a great cycle. Works really well. Uh, don't use water fresheners in your toilets. Uh, water fresheners are those things that turn the toilet bowl blue and they make it kind of smell pretty. So water fresheners like that can actually, um, some of those chemicals can actually act as hormone disruptors or cause other problems. And most um, sewage treatment plants are not able to process those chemicals out of the sewage water. Most of the chemicals that are in the wastewater end up going out into the ocean or lake, depending on where you live. Uh, you wanna make sure you do not flush your unwanted medicine down the toilet, we talked about that. And do whatever you can to substitute biodegradable soaps for your regular hand soap or dish soap or laundry detergent. Biodegradable soaps typically don't contain any phosphates in them, so they're not going to contribute to eutrophication. And they also will break down more quickly, so they don't persist in the waste stream as chemicals. They actually break down and can be decomposed, so they just go right back into nitrates and phosphates and whatever. So that can still cause a little bit of trouble, but biodegradable soaps are much better for the environment than uh, traditional soaps and detergents. And then finally, make sure that you, any pesticides, paints, solvents, oil, antifreeze, any other products containing chemicals, make sure that you do not pour them down the drain or onto the ground. Don't take them outside and pour them down the storm drain because that drains to the ocean or lake as well. That's the storm drain system. Don't take them inside your house and pour them down your drain or flush them down your toilet or wash them down your tub. You definitely want to avoid um, disposing of any of those chemicals like that. If you have chemicals and you don't know what to do, it's a really good idea just to go online and Google like um, how to dispose of paint or how to dispose of antifreeze. And there will be um, websites that will tell you like which phone numbers to call or who to contact in your county or your city who's in charge of that because a lot of cities and counties have disposal programs where they will take these kinds of like old paint or antifreeze or oil and they'll actually treat it and dispose of it properly so that it doesn't end up in our aquatic systems. So make sure that you're careful about what you do inside and outside your house relating to water and just remember that anytime it rains whatever you've dumped out on your ground is then going to wash into the storm drain system. So dumping it outside is not a good idea either and you just want to pay attention to your actions and how you affect our planet. So this is the beginning of chapter 14. We're still going to cover a lot of other things. Um, we didn't talk about sediment pollution. We didn't talk about thermal pollution. So those things will come later in the chapter in future lectures. But for now, um, this is where we're going to end it for today. So thanks very much for listening, and I hope you learned something.